and maybe a bit of an exorcism for the space itself, to be honest. But sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. So that's just five minutes in. <laughs> Night one, minute five. Shall I go on? Davina and I finally sat down to record the full story of our life-changing journey to Costa Rica in November of 2020 to sit with the plant medicine ayahuasca. We dive deep into each of the four ceremonies, what we saw, what we felt, and most importantly, what we've learned by integrating these experiences into our lives. It was a lot of fun to revisit after this much time had gone by, especially as I was about to head out into my next journey with ayahuasca a few days later. I hope you enjoyed this ayahuasca story with Davina and myself. I feel like this is going to be really tough. Why is that? Because it's been a while. I don't have any of my original notes in front of me, which might be for the better. And I don't know. It was a very intense experience. I don't know how I'm going to be able to put it into words. Yeah, I have all my notes prepared, so we'll see who who has the better recollection between the two of us it's not a competition do you want to start by giving a little background on where we went and why originally the idea came from you so I feel like yeah it's funny because I normally have a really good memory about these kinds of things but when it comes to ayahuasca I don't know it just dropped into my life and this is what happens when things that when you're called to do something, it comes from a lot of different places and then you don't really remember where you first heard about it it just kind of comes from yeah different sources and so I have no idea where I first heard about ayahuasca I know that the first time I heard about it I was like whoa no way <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually kept hearing about it from different places and got more and more curious and then was like this is calling me yeah personally I've I struggled my whole life, honestly, I think I was depressed even when I was a kid on and off with depressive episodes and as an adult as well. And I was just seeking anything that could help me. Um, I was on antidepressants that year and they gave me hope for the first time. They showed me like what life could be like if I wasn't constantly falling into these depressive episodes. And But they also numbed me out in a lot of ways and I didn't feel like I had connection to my own emotions anymore. And yeah, there was a lot that I was seeking. I don't know when you got on board. That's the question. Yeah. I also remember being like, when you told me that you were interested in this, I was like, no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When did it turn around for us? I have no idea. All I know is that we were, I believe in Vegas, <laughs> like the opposite of right. an ayahuasca ceremony. <laughs> I think this was February, 2020 when we like actually signed up officially or it was around that time for sure. Mm -hmm. And so that the commitment was made. And what they say with ayahuasca is that once you've made the decision that you're going to be sitting with the medicine, your ceremony begins. Mm -hmm. And I know that was definitely the case for us, but also remember I said, February, 2020. So remember what happened just like a month later, we all know. So that certainly forced us to begin a ceremony of sorts. I know for myself, there was so much fear around doing this that I don't know. I think I just had to face that fear for the nine months before we actually mm -hmm. showed up and did this thing. So that was a big part of it for me. It was a lot of research because that's just the kind of person I am. I needed to know more. And we watched a lot of YouTube videos and I read a lot of books and just it kickstarted the, the next level of my spiritual journey just to have said yes to mm. doing this thing. Yeah. I remember the reality of truth documentary. Yeah. That was like a big catalyst for me in the, just when we did start looking at videos and testimonials, that one really gave me a better understanding of what it was and how beautiful of experience it can be. And yeah, I think it gave me a different understanding of what we were embarking on. Yeah, absolutely. I know like you personally, you actually just went through a lot that year. It was a lot for everybody. And you kind of used it as an opportunity to practice a lot of surrender. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot of practices. You got really deep into yoga and you were like 
just breath work. Breath work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where did we go? We went to Rhythmia yes. uh, in Costa Rica, just outside of Tamarindo. We chose that place because it had a lot of five-star reviews and it seemed like a very comfortable place, uh, a little bit of the opposite of some of the remote Amazonian jungle retreats that you see, which I think are a beautiful experience as well, but probably a much more authentic experience really. Yeah. But personally, I just felt I was already so afraid. I had so much fear around it that to know that I was going to be in a place that felt very safe to me, you know, they do have medics present and they do background check or like that, medical background. Yes. Like they, so they make sure that you are healthy and yeah, they do have the medic present and all of that made me feel very comfortable reading a ton of reviews. I just, I could not picture myself doing something so hard and then also being like, uncomfortable physically. Yeah. <laughs> Not it's already very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But knowing that we had like a comfortable bed at the end of the day and the food was awesome and all of that just it definitely helped me to just feel more comfortable with the experience. Yeah, for an experience that potentially can be so uncomfortable, it's nice to have been in an environment that actually was very yes. comfortable. Yeah. That being said, in the future, I would maybe be more open now. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting to a place now where I've released a lot of my need for comfort. You're probably laughing in your head right now, but for me, at least I feel like I'm coming, I've come a long way. I didn't even like camping before. Like I couldn't even imagine like going camping. So, Hey, I've come a long way. <laughs> so yeah. So we went to Rhythmia and we did have a wonderful experience in terms of that place. Um, yeah. And we met some beautiful, incredible people that we could talk about forever as well. Yeah. But this is about our experience. Yeah. The couple of weeks leading up to our trip. I remember oh, yeah. very well because that's when we really started our dieta. It started a bit earlier because we cut out caffeine and cannabis at that point. I had to get off my antidepressants. That's right. That was a big thing for that you That was as a well. big thing. Yeah. And then in the two weeks leading up, you cut out everything from oils, yeah. sugar, salts, dairy, red meats, yeah. processed food of any kind. So you go down to eating really basics, yes. ri rice, quinoa, vegetables, some fruits, not all are allowed. Very bland, flavorless food. And it's, it seems like such a simple, trivial thing. But when you start doing that for a few days and two weeks is a long time, you, you just realize how much you rely on food for comfort, how much you reach for it when you feel mm -hmm. a little bit uncomfortable and you need a little dopamine hit. And all of the snacks and all of the things are usually contain ingredients that you shouldn't be consuming before ayahuasca. So yeah. it got very hard uh, about a weekend. I remember we were both standing in the kitchen. We just started crying for <laughs> no reason. <laughs> like, this is hard. It was already hard. Yeah. yeah. And even TV, you know, you're supposed to right. reduce your intake of news and social media and all this kind of like getting your body to a pure state, um, purging before sitting for the medicine. And yeah, that was super intense for me. I remember going to see the osteopath and he was just like, how's it going? And I was like, I feel like I'm standing here naked and I'm like wobbly, but I have no crutches. I just feel like a shell of myself because I have nothing to fall back on anymore. Food or the antidepressants or weed, which was a big part of our lives back then. And even Still TV. Is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but not as big as it was back then. And yeah, so just, it was really difficult. Even sex you have to cut out. Like, so you literally are just, you're just being, you know, what is, what am I, who am I without all of those things? And these are things that I love for making life as a human more enjoyable. So to just as an offering to this like sacred medicine to say, I will make the sacrifice for you. And as a, and for me, as a, a show of dedication and of, of respect to the process and to this ancient wisdom of plants. So it's beautiful to partake in, in a sort of stricter dieta, but it's freaking hard. It was yeah. so hard. I will say also like Rhythmia doesn't suggest this specific diet. They're a lot looser with what they suggest, but we chose to do this stricter diet because we just were so all in. And I'm really glad that we did. We both didn't throw up 
And during ayahuasca, which we didn't know was even possible. Actually, I did throw up once, which will probably come up. But I don't know if it was because of this dieta, but I do know that ayahuasca, one of the first things that the medicine might tackle is, you know, ridding you of toxins. And if you've already done a strict diet and and reduced a lot of those toxins in your body or in your mind also, that you might have less to purge. I don't know if there's any evidence about that, but it seems to me like it would make sense. I remember that again, coming up, no pun intended, like a lot during the ceremony, just how good I felt physically. Mm -hmm. and my gut, my intuition was telling me it was because we did such a clean dieta for two weeks leading up to it. Yeah. And I just remember feeling like grateful that we did that work ahead of time. And then that helped me feel even better. And it just kept on this like cycle of gratitude and feeling good. Hopefully you're not too cocky because you're now (laughs) on the dieta, you're day five into the dieta. Yeah. Yeah. It feels different this time. I guess I knew what to expect a little bit more. So there's a little bit less surprise. Doesn't make it necessarily easier. I'm still craving a lot of the food that I would normally crave, Mm -hmm. but I'm confident I'm going to get through it. I mean, I don't really have a choice at this point. I'm I'm on this train and there's no hopping off. Um, The other crazy thing that started happening leading up to ceremony was the dreams and getting off cannabis for us was obviously one of the reasons why the dreams kicked in. Yeah. The dreams kicked in. And I had a particularly interesting one where my dad who passed away five and a half years ago, visited me and we were, he was basically driving me to Rhythmia. And even though I had never been before, it was a very vivid dream. I was sitting in the front seat next to him, but neither one of us was talking. And it was also very reminiscent of my childhood and my teenage years when my dad would drive us all over the place even our adult years because he would bring us to the airport when we travel yeah so like him driving us is like a big part of our story so he's driving me we're not speaking but it it just felt so real and there was birds flying and there was a big tree in the entrance and it was like a specific gravel road and i remember when i woke up that morning i told you that i had this dream and i described it to you and i even drew it in my Mm -hmm. journal because I wanted to see how accurate it was going to be once we got there to see if there was any psychic spiritual connection between the dream and reality. And sure enough, like what I saw in my dream was very close to the way the entrance and the drive feels and looks like. And I remember in the van, as we were arriving, we like glanced at each other. Oh shit, this is just like the dream. Something happened there. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was a pretty cool experience. That was really special. And your dad played a role in the rest of some of your other experiences as we'll get into. Yeah. It, for me, it really helped me like go into it with an open mind because I started seeing the spiritual realm interfere, not interfere, but your channel, I think opened yeah. up, right. And right. dreams, dreams are such a, a key way of receiving some of these messages and of connecting. Yeah. And at the time I, w- I think I was much more closed to all these spiritual ideas and concepts Mm. And yeah, it just helped open my mind and be more open going into the experience. Do you feel like, cause I, I, the answer for me seeing you is yes, but I'm curious what you think that there was like a you before ayahuasca and a you after ayahuasca. For sure. There is, it's a little hazy though. Like I know my views have changed. My relation with the world has changed. Yeah. Just who I am and how I feel and how I interact is very different. Yeah. But I can't like, I don't necessarily have an image of a, like a before and an after. I want to say that I have never, I had never, and we've been together now 15 years. It's going to be 15 years in a couple months. And at that point I had never seen the side of you Hmm. that I saw that week at Rhythmia, the way that you were like your energy and the way people were drawn to you and that people like wanted to talk to you one-on-one about their experiences. I was like, what is going on? It was like, I had never seen that side of you before. Oh, good. The Sandia vendor is here. (laughs) I'll give him a moment to pass. Yeah. It's the the speaker that's strapped to the top (laughs) of the car that goes along around the street selling fruit. Pura vida. Yeah. Yesterday during my women's uh, circle, the journaling group that I host we we're talking about sex and it was just like send you a, a nice <laughs> is that a comic. euphemism for something <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> it means watermelon i don't know how you would uh. 
So shall we? Yeah. Um, there, so it, as part of the week long retreat, there's a lot of time spent in class, Yeah, which I really appreciate it uh, because a lot of these like spiritual concepts and mindfulness awareness concepts were fairly new to me. And one of the things they encourage you to do as things come up during ceremony is to ask yourself these four different questions, which are, how is this making me feel? Do I feel this way in real life? When do I recall feeling this way and why? And who have I become as a result? And I used uh, this exercise quite a bit throughout the week. And at some point it just became so natural. I would get the answers just delivered to me before I even had the chance to speak those words. It was, it was like a very helpful tool when something hard would come up, just start questioning it, start interacting with it, and the answers come from there. Yeah, I was not able to interact to that extent to, to the point where I could remember these questions and ask them. Although I did have moments where I asked, do I feel this way in my everyday life? Or when do I feel this way? And when's the first time I remember feeling this way? That was another question that we were invited to ask. And whenever I did ask these questions, whenever I was able to find those questions to be able to ask them during ceremony, I did get answers and it was really, really helpful to guiding the ceremony in a way. Yeah. Instead of talking in abstract, do you want to yes. get into it? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like uh, if I was listening to us talk, yeah. I'd be like, get into it already. Tell us what you saw. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Do you want to go first for, for, with your night one? Okay. You yes. I'm going off of memory instead of off of my notes, which I think might be a good thing. It's, this is how it's happening. So this is how it's going to be. Right, hold on. Let me just preface that there were four ceremonies, yes. four nights in a row, and we'll go through it one by one. Okay. So night one, Arrhythmia does provide sort of these suggestions for intentions and intentions actually, I think since then have become a big part of my life in general. Like I will constantly be bringing intention into things I'm doing, whether it's breath work or meditation, or even just like a trip to the beach or something. I try to bring more intention into my life since then. And the first kind of intention that they suggest for night one is to ask the question or to ask to be shown what you've become. So show me who I've become. So you, we step up there. I've never been more nervous in my whole life. And this, like these beautiful shamans, I always went to Sarah. I was really drawn to her energy. She was wonderful. And I get the, my cup of ayahuasca, take it, tastes interesting, awful. And I asked, yeah, into my cup, show me who I've become. And that was my intention for night one. And so as it's kicking in, you're in silence. They don't play the music yet. It's just terrifying. Like it's absolutely <laughs> terrifying. You're like, I just drank a cup of ayahuasca. I have no idea what's in store for me. And I have to sit here in silence, basically questioning all of my life choices that brought me to this moment <laughs> and trust. And I remember being there, like you have to surrender, like you have to surrender. You cannot fight this thing. So I'm sitting there basically holding myself being like, I surrender, I surrender. That's not quite how surrender works. It's uh, it's all I was capable of at the moment. And as soon as it kicked in, the answer to my question, show me who I've become. It was fear. It was just fear. I was terrified. I could hear my own voice in my head echoing. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. It was like a echo. I felt this energy inside of me that just consumed me and terrified me. And I don't know how long this went on for, but I started seeing, it's so hard to describe because I didn't see things. I like felt them like the dream, but not, but anyway, I feel, or I sense that I'm at the corner of the street where my grandparents lived and I'm hovering above that area. And in, this is the house where I was sexually abused as a child. And much of my childhood was spent in that house. And then around the corner, there was a men's prison for a long time. So when I was a little girl, I remember being like in a stroller and walking around there with my grandmother and seeing the men like playing badminton and stuff outside. So it was a men's prison. And there's this place where I was like sexually abused. And then there was an army like training place. So all of this was within that one corner, street corner. And in this experience, I was hovering above that space and feeling all of this toxic masculine energy. And I could see it and feel it wrapping around me. It was barbed wire and around the prison, they had barbed wire. And it was like a vortex of like negative energy of toxic masculinity, 
all of that was whirling, swirling around and wrapping me in barbed wire. And it was obviously terrifying and just so intense. And I felt like I needed to throw up like that energy was stuck within me and it needed to come out. And I just could not throw up. And I was trying and I was like, I was just so uncomfortable. And then out of nowhere, Sarah, the shaman comes to me. She whispered these things in my ear. I don't even really remember what she said. I feel like I could hear her words, but I couldn't like grab onto them, but they were still like releasing me of this energy. And she, through her words, just soothed me and calmed me. And then I heard a voice inside me say, it doesn't have to be violent. It can be gentle. And I felt like that was the release that was referring to the release. And then I started yawning, but like not yawning, like the way you've ever yawned, probably like my entire body felt like it was a yawn. It was just like, and I felt like it was echoing through the room and it was like so intense, but it was so freeing. It was like through the yawn, I was purging out this energy that needed to be released that I thought needed to be released in a violent way, in a throwing up way, but actually the yawning, which is much more gentle than throwing up. I was being shown that it can be gentle. Like I have always thought in life that things need to be hard for me and I need to suffer. And if I'm not suffering enough, then I'm not doing the right thing. And just with that, God, like first five, 10 minutes of ayahuasca, I don't know how long had gone by. I already was like, oh, I understand. Mm -hmm. Like even this can be gentle. And then the barbed wire, it just released. I was over the intersection again, or the corner. I could see what was going on below me. And then through my love, literally, I was like, my heart chakra felt like so open. I was just allowing my love to create a garden out of the compost of horrible things that had happened in this place, of all of the energy that had existed there. And I just allowed myself to forgive the space. And I felt so powerful that I was doing that. Like I was releasing the space and out of that experience, a garden was growing and it was like a wild garden with vines and flowers. And I felt my energy just floating so light above the space. And I just felt like I had done that. I had brought love and forgiveness to that corner and now look what had come out of it. Mm -hmm. And side note regarding that house, just before I, we came to Costa Rica, the house that my grandparents had been in for so long was sold and they moved my grandmother out of the house. My grandfather had passed away years earlier and I went to the house because it was my last chance. I knew that like when I would come back from Costa Rica, it would be in the hands of the new owner and I would never be able to see the house again. So I went as a ceremony to myself and brought my camera and I took self portraits in the rooms where I had experienced abuse and it was, I cried and my dad had come with me and he was, it was so sweet because he was like, didn't know what was going on. It was such a personal experience, but at the same time, I just wanted him there. And he was so supportive and just hugged me when I needed to be hugged. And it was just like a really powerful experience to be in the space with nobody there anymore. It was an empty house. And I was like standing in my power in these rooms and allowing myself to release the space. And then this experience with ayahuasca felt very similar. It was like another closing of that chapter. And yeah, there's now the house is being rebuilt by some, the person who bought it. And she's it's a, a woman an entrepreneur who's like building it with her dad. And they're like, there's like a, a masculine and daughter kind of energy that's literally like renovating this home. Mm -hmm. And that energy is going into it now. And I just, I don't want to say it's thanks to my, what I did, but I also think it's such a beautiful continuation of that legacy and that I really feel like I was able to release the space of the hold that it had on me and, and maybe a bit of an exorcism for the space itself, to be honest, but sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. So that's just five minutes in <laughs> night one minute five. Shall I go on? You're on a good road. Okay. Go ahead. 
So on the other side of this experience, I, they, so they build the music. It's a beautiful ceremony with this music that they choose. And just, we still listen to this music all the time. And it's this, the music that kind of like guides what you're seeing and what you're experiencing as well. And there's this like kind of tribal beats. And I just had started having visions. Some of the strongest visions I had during my whole experience of these like warrior women, there was like African woman warrior there was an indigenous woman warrior. There was just one after another, like a slideshow of these strong women who were like looking at me. I felt like they were me, essentially. It was like, I am them and they are me. And I felt like it was showing me that is who I am. And then I did something that not a lot of people do. And I got up and I had an embodied experience. I walked around the room. I went outside. I was carrying my blanket over my shoulders, like a cape or something. Um, and I just felt like every step was empowering me more and more. It was like this feeling in my chest just felt like it was glowing. I had this ball of light within me. And I was just like, this is who I am. Like I needed that experience so much to feel so empowered and that with every step, I know who I am and I'm connected to the light within me. Just that was worth the whole experience. Like I just needed it. I just mm. really needed that. I had never felt so in my power. And since then, honestly, like I can get back to that place because I was shown what it's like. It was a lived experience. It was a felt sense of empowerment that I can go back to now. That was a huge gift that I got. And it was just beautiful. I was walking around and I had moments where I felt my light start to dim when I would near other people. And I felt that they were struggling. I felt that my light was like starting to dim and I felt a difficult energy coming over me. And then I would, my intuition just knew what to do. It was like, step away, rebuild your light, breathe. I was just guided all evening after that, all night. I was guided to what to do. And my intuition was so strong. I was completely just knew what to do. It, I channeled some words that I even ended up jotting down in my notebook, which were like so messy because it was in the dark, but it was flow, glow, let it go, breathe. I remember being like screaming, breathe. Whenever I would start to feel like scared again, it was breathe. It was just echoing in my head. So just Again, like, yes, how to navigate an ayahuasca ceremony was being taught to me, but also just how to navigate like fear in general and like a lot of difficult things in life, like breath, like being told to breathe so much. Like we literally now, like a year and a half later, are both being facilitated as breath works and breath is such a big part of our lives. Yeah. It's what I see my future as being so connected to showing this to others. So it's interesting to remember that it's something that I was shown during this experience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm sure there were a million other things that happened that <laughs> night, but that was uh, the gist of it. Yeah. I remember that you started with the first 30 minutes of sitting in mm -hmm. silence on your mat, especially on night one. It's like the most terrifying thing. And then you hear one person start throwing up and then another one or there's 50, 60 other people. So it gets so loud in there. It's yeah. like a zoo. <laughs> You're just like, uh oh, am I next? Am I next? But I also like leading up to the, our retreat. I started listening to Icaros and mm -hmm. like general ayahuasca music and started trying to interact with it a little bit. Almost like, I trust you, please be gentle, which was something that Abby and Dave had recommended mm -hmm. to us. And it was a very helpful tool for me while I was sitting there in the, the, that 30 minutes of silence before the medicine really kicks in. Just being like, I trust you. I surrender. I love you. Please be gentle. And it would just like, go <laughs> around and around and but also give my mind something to really focus on. So the first night, it wasn't super visual, especially compared to the other nights that I had. But I remember this like green mesh coming down and floating a few feet above me, very like futuristic feeling and all of my thoughts and feelings and myself, I felt between my body and this mesh, like I was a little bit out of body but not completely exploded out into the universe. And my intention was, well, overall, it was to reconnect with a lot of my childhood memories because I've always had trouble uh, recalling parts of my childhood or any of it for, for the most part. And so that's really what I wanted to get out of the experience. I also 
you know, set the intention to show me who I've become. But I think ayahuasca knows what your real intention yeah. is. You can say whatever you want into the cup, but you knows what the truth is. And for me, it was to, you it know, it will give you what you need for better or for worse. <laughs> exactly. So the first thing that started happening is like these little pockets of memory, almost like bubbles started floating in around me. And they were mostly of my sister and all of the times that she took care of me and all the chats we had in her room as little kids or smoking cigarettes out on the front porch when we were teenagers. <laughs> and for me, it was like a big distraction from some of the fighting that was happening in the house. And they just, she was just like such a good companion and such a like genuine loving presence in my life as we were growing up. And I was just like shown how much I had forgotten about this. And I had so much gratitude for her. So I spent a lot of time in all of that, which was a beautiful way to start. And shortly after the call for the second cup, I don't know how much time goes by. I would assume like 45 minutes, an hour. I don't think so. it's much. Yeah. Maybe yeah. an hour at most. And what they say is if you what do they say? If you can hear us calling for the second cup, and get, you can up, get up to and get you it. can get up to yeah. get it, then go and drink the second cup. Mm -hmm. I could hear them pretty clearly. I was able to stand up. I was like, all right, got to go get the second cup. That's when we ran into each other. That's right. We like arrived at the... There were two lines. Yeah. We arrived to the shamans like side by side, yeah. which was pretty cool. And I remember we like grabbed each other's hands and mm -hmm. was like, oh my God, we're doing this. No idea what the other person's been experiencing up until then and dying yeah. to know at the same time. Yeah. And then... The shaman who was serving me asks me if I had perched yet, which I, I, I can see the importance of it, but it also threw me off a little bit. I was like, why is that relevant? And I said, no. And he, I tried to drink the second cup and at the moment it touched my lips, I, it just would not go down. And then he looks at me with the most intense wolf yeah, eyes. He's very intense. And he goes, drink it all, brother. And I was just, I felt like a little kid. I was so terrified in that moment and i tried i like put as much of it as i could in my mouth and the moment i did i just started gagging and i ran to my mat and to my bucket and it wasn't like a real purge but yeah just dry heaving and like spitting it out and then the other the remaining half of the cup stayed by the side of my bed for the rest of the night and i really had an experience with that with that half cup just yeah. sitting there for me, it was such a representation of all the times when I was fearful as a kid, when I would arrive to a party and I didn't want to be there. I felt like people were judging me. I didn't want to ride roller coasters. I didn't want to do any of like the things that scared me. I never fear. wanted to push through it. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. fear as well. And I just spiraled into all of this negative self-talk because of this half cup that was still sitting there. So, <laughs> oh, how can you? You're such a little wuss. You're that was my night too. And... I don't think we ever realized. I don't think I've ever made the connection. Yeah. It, yeah. It got really intense. Like my self-talk yeah. like was really shown to me like how negative it can be in those instances. And I needed to, to get a little bit of space from it. So I just decided to get up and go outside and get some fresh air. I didn't even realize that I past you. I didn't even know where you were in the yeah. room, really. So I didn't put this part in my um, description. <laughs> I didn't include this part. Yeah. Um, but I did, as I was being my warrior self, went outside and saw Daniel by the fire. And when I saw him, my whole like energy, like I felt like his energy was really like heavy and I absorbed it. It was like a magnet. It just felt like, you know, I'm in my power. And then suddenly I see you and I was just like, oh, something's wrong. It just felt really heavy and I was carrying it and I was just like walking with it. And I felt like I was going to throw up. And I went back to my mat and puked in my bucket. That's the only time I threw up. And I also like you spat out half of my cup on the third night, but an actual like purge. And it was from seeing you. And one of the things they suggest, which is sounds hilarious and weird, but when you throw up to ask your purge, what are you? Because you just released something and it can be helpful to know what it is. So I threw up and then I asked my vomit, what are you? And it said, oh, like, it's not yours, it's Daniel's. And I was like, oh, thanks, Daniel. Mm, so you're like, welcome. Thank you. And we obviously learned this later on, but when I did go outside, I did feel a lot better. 
And thank you for picking up my <laughs> negative energy and You're purging welcome. it for me. So then I went back to my mat. And so when you arrive in the Maloka, which is the space where everything takes place, you don't have an assigned spot. So you just intuitively try to pick your mat. And I, my only requisite was to be by the window and to have back support. So I try to go along the wall somewhere. And I ended up between these two guys and one of them on my left, he was there with his mom and he was a little bit younger than me. And I felt like he was like the, obviously he wasn't a child, but he represented the mm -hmm. child and it made me think of Max. A little bit younger than you. He was like 15 years younger than you. Was he? Shit, how old am I? <laughs> <laughs> and then on my right was a guy my age, but I think it was this, you know, third or fourth time at Rhythmia. And so he had a lot of more experience with plant medicines. And so I just felt well surrounded by someone with more experience that represented the father figure and someone as the child. And yeah, so when I came back to my mat from being outside, John, the father figure wasn't there anymore. And it just right away made me think of my dad who is no longer there either. And I wasn't getting that many memories of my dad, but I just like process like all of the sadness of my dad passing away. And I just lay down in fetal position and like sobbed and sobbed. And yeah. it really, it was a, like a full takeover. And it was just such a big release until there were no more tears left. The sobbing is like, it's such an indescribable feeling yeah. that for me too, on night one, I did have a moment as well where I like sobbed in fetal position. And it's just the more you cry, the more you cry. It just feels <laughs> yeah. like it takes you over and yet feels so good at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a purge as well, but it's just crying for everything there is to cry about. And it is yeah. full body visceral experience. Yeah. And yeah, I, I had gratitude for those tears because they do feel good. It's such a like beautiful release mm -hmm. and you, you feel lighter because that energy that you're carrying around with you is able to move out of you. And I also knew that crying is a form of purging. And I was like, oh, thank you for like allowing me to purge through my tears and not through <laughs> my vomit or other bodily fluids. <laughs> and well, no, I guess crying is still bodily fluids. Right. <laughs> a little less gross yeah. than some of the other alternatives. Yeah. But yeah, once you like hit this like stride of gratitude, you get washed with this feeling of love. Yeah. And then I started thinking, or the memory of my grandmother taking care of me started coming to me. And memory or just times of our friends, Robbie and Jess, looking out after us and being just such amazing friends. And you as well being so loving and there for me, just like all of these people and all of these in instances where I, I have felt the love, but I just failed to really see it and recognize it. And I was just so grateful that it was still there waiting for me, even though I didn't fully acknowledge it in the moment. And it was a really beautiful and profound way for me to end the first ceremony. Yeah, it's interesting because we both experienced a lot of fear at the beginning of our ceremonies. And it's that fear was transformed when it was released into like gratitude and love and fear being the opposite of that, of yeah. gratitude and love and just feeling what it feels like to be completely taken over by both of those extremes was such a gift. It's so scary and then so amazing. And yeah. It's just, I had some visuals on night one that were really cool, but they weren't like part of any sort of profound messages or anything, but I did really enjoy, they freaked me out and also enjoyed them. Like the fractals and the sacred geometry that I saw, I thought that was like a really like interesting layer to it that you feel like, so like you've tapped into a different realm that this is what's part of your, it's like in your third eye. I don't know. I just wanted to make note of that because it is pretty incredible yeah. to what you're able to see and access. And these are things that people I know are able to access in like meditative states too, or in like, I've had the experience with breath work to go back to that place. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 
also remember going to your mat at the end of night one and yeah. we just sat there and cuddled and listened to like the yeah. music. We and, broke the rules. Technically, you're not yeah. supposed to do that, but it was the end of the night. And I think it was like, we're both yeah. like coming down and yeah. yeah, we came and I just like in your nook. And I remember feeling like we were like a yin and yang symbol. Totally. Yeah. And I felt the balance of our energy. And I feel like I've never felt more at peace than mm. like in that moment in your arms. And we started whispering to each other a little bit and we we're just like dying yeah. to share our experiences. But I just knew like you came when you came and we laid together. It was just like, oh, we both had felt so much love and we are still like fully embodying like the love and the gratitude and then to be able to like, share it just in that physical like cuddle. It was such a beautiful moment. Yeah. All right. Night two. I'll yeah. go first because that was an interesting one for me. Yeah. We had very different experiences <laughs> on night two. The first thing is that I remember feeling quite nervous for this one as well in that like 30 minutes of silence. You never get less drinking. nervous. No, you never really do. because no. you, you know, it's not going to be the same thing. So yeah, what's in for me this tonight? But I also intuitively remember just stopping and looking at the nervousness and being like, what am I actually nervous about? What is this feeling of nervousness? And for one, it was the darkness. And then it was the silence. Mm -hmm. And I quickly realized that the darkness is like a blind canvas. It shouldn't be that scary. It's just an opportunity for anything to be painted on it. That's the void. Yeah. And it can be a beautiful thing. And it doesn't need to be like this scary thing that we feel as kids that the darkness is scary but here I, I don't know i just had such a different analysis of it and so that fear of the darkness turned into excitement and then the silence i just started appreciating it because as parents our lives are a little bit loud at times and it's hard to find those silent moments which i particularly feel that i need them and i just had this like deep appreciation for the silence and so my nerves turned upside down into excitement for what was about to come. And as soon as the music started, I don't know if it was like on purpose, their playlist was just like more out there and more intense, but like the visual kicked in to like ultra high gear. It was all these like green geometric shapes intertwined with like lizards and frogs and all kinds of reptiles that night in my visuals yeah and i just felt like i was being transported into another world but the thing is like it's it did not feel scary like i thought and i still think i'm about to sit again in a couple of weeks and my ego thinks like we're about to have this like scary experience but if i stop and think about it it felt like a gentle disney ride you know where you're just like <laughs> sitting there and it's taking you through a tunnel and things are coming at you but you're not actually suspended upside down and you can't tell up from down or at least that experience. I think you all are possible. I guess. I don't know. I like it was very strong yet. I was able to take a deep breath and like be in control of myself to a certain extent and rearrange my body and pull a blanket over if I needed to. So it was like intense, but also very comfortable at the same time. And I feel like it's important to say it because just hearing about like the visuals can, can, can sound very scary Can sound very scary. Yeah. From there, I started feeling a lot of tension in my jaw. And uh oh, we're about to go there. We're about to go there. Yeah. All right. Should we side pause here and um, introduce cosmic surgeries? The aliens. <laughs> so, cosmic surgeries are a thing that happens quite often when you drink ayahuasca. And it's typically performed by one of four beings. That's, yeah. I don't know about if it's one of four. I think there's probably an infinite amount of types of beings I that guess. it can be. But at Rhythmia, they've some people are like, oh, so I saw an alien last night. And he operated on me. It's like, oh, right. Okay. So that happens sometimes. And from there, because they've had like, I think over 10,000 guests by now. So they have a really great bank of accounts of people's experiences. And they found that praying mantis type alien things are very commonly seen and that people have been operated on in under on the medicine. And there's also different types of beings. I think that people have reported that come up a lot, but the praying mantis, like just in our group alone, there were like a good amount of people who like yeah. had experienced the praying mantis. Yeah. 
<laughs> it just sounds so crazy. Um, Go ahead, continue. Tell us about your surgery. Yeah. So, in that instance, the praying mantis did visit me on night three, but on. Oh, sorry. It was on night two. No, on night two, it just felt like little ants, light ants. Mm -hmm. There was, oh, yeah. you know, hundreds or thousands of them. I just felt like they entered my body and they started, the first went to my jaw and it was very tense. And I just immediately felt all of that tension release. Just like all, but it hurt at first. No, not that one. It, it, it was like I felt very surrendered in the moment, and I just felt my jaw really released. It helps to know that this is something that can happen too. Exactly, absolutely. And then I, I was on two, two, three years of shoulder pain at that point, so it was something that I was definitely hoping that they would help me with. So after releasing the tension in my jaw, they moved down to my shoulder. And my arm, my whole arm, my shoulders started moving uncontrollably on the mat. There was something definitely going on. And again, it wasn't scary. It all felt very natural. I felt very trusting of these beings doing whatever they needed to do. And at the same time, I was giving them gratitude for trying to fix my shoulder. And my shoulder was fixed, you know. Mm -hmm. not the next day. I think it's important to specify, like I didn't wake up the next day. I was like, my shoulder is fixed, but I, very a short time after, like maybe three, four five weeks later, I was, my shoulder was back to almost a hundred percent and it has yeah. been doing great since. I'm very jealous. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> after fixing my shoulder, I remember this like scanner working down my body to see if there were any areas of me that needed to be corrected so to speak and it was a bit of funny moment but as they were working their way down towards my genitals I just intuitively knew that they might try to reverse my vasectomy and <laughs> because it's not in its natural state it's not the way that it's supposed to be and I don't know if it's something that they can do or not but I just remember like started speaking to them I was like no 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 I need this I need this <laughs> and the scanning of my body stopped and they, they listened they listened and they went away oh after that I just was blasted off into what is called hyperspace it's did, really did you have another cup I did not No, actually I did not I, I remember it was just so intense like the visuals I remember hearing the, the, call. the call, Sarah saying, we will now be serving the second cup. And it was like my visual paused for a moment, and like in a cartoon, like it was an opening, like a circle opening. Mm -hmm. And I heard her voice in that opening. And like the moment I was like, there is no way I can get up. Sure. I, maybe I can hear you, but it doesn't really sound like it's happening here. There's no way I could get up right now. As soon as I had that thought, like whoop, the circle closed up and I continued on my journey. So I was just really in this like black void, which I've recently learned is called the hyperspace. And there I was transported to the base of these giant red cliffs. And there were two holes at the base of them. And I intuitively knew that they were for you and I, and to say goodbye to our bodies and for our souls to move on to whatever was next in the universe. And I knew, like I was there, but you weren't there with me, even though I knew that it was meant for you. And I, I just knew that you're possibly having a hard time that evening, which you'll be able to speak about after. But I still said my goodbyes to you, even though you were in there physically. And then I said goodbye to my body, which I saw being physically deposited in that hole in the ground at the base of the cliff. You actually saw your body? I actually saw, saw my body just like... Zoop. Like, Whoa. yeah, levitate and deposit it into that hole. And then my soul or my awareness, whatever you want to call it, just took off into the rest of the universe. And it's hard to recall the full details, but I remember making it to what felt like the edge of the universe where it was like contained in this bubble that was like in constant motion. And I asked, what is on the other side of this universe? And the universe just kept expanding in on itself and just showing me that it's completely infinite and ever expanding. I was taken to what I describe as like source temple. And I don't, I don't know enough about the 5D realms and like all the dimensions and whatnot, but 
I've had visions of this white temple in my dreams at other times or previously, previously and since as well. And for me, it's really where our souls go to be cleansed and go back to reincarnate elsewhere or on earth again. It was almost like a tour, like a guided tour. Like here's the edge of the universe. And over here on your left, you have source temple. And over here on the right, you have where all of the darkness resides. Oh my gosh. Remember when we watched Soul, the yeah. Disney movie? I was like, oh my God, Daniel, it's like your ayahuasca yeah, experience. Really accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. N- not much happened in any of these places. What about- the darkness, after seeing the white temple, I was taken to the place where all of this darkness resides, which makes sense. Like in a world of duality, like you need mm-hmm. the dark to work with the light. And I felt that darkness trying to take over me and suck me in. And I intuitively and through the lessons we were receiving that week in class, I just gave it love. I was like, I don't want to go there. I love you. Thank you for being here. And the moment I did that, it just left me alone and moved on. And I was able to move on as well. After this guided tour or a quick guided tour of the universe, I'm sure there's a lot more to explore. I slowly started coming back to earth. I remember just floating above the earth and then slowly making my way back into my body. And I felt like I was deposited in like the basin of the Amazon forest. It was like very lush and fresh. And at the same time, I could start breathing the fresh air coming in from the window and the music they were playing was much gentler and softer. Mm -hmm. There's just like such a beautiful way to come back into my body. And I had such a deeper understanding of the cycle of the soul and our, how we come here to incarnate and how we have multiple lives and we go back into the universe and source and come back and just how we need to, you know, take better care of our souls. And I felt like it was given back into like my physical hands, like my soul. And then I brought it close to my face and I whispered, I promise I'll take better care of you. Meaning I will have a deeper connection with spirituality and with source. I'm Uh, sorry, but I just picture like the scene of this place yeah. we know what it's like people are puking their guts out there's people like, on all <laughs> fours like one woman thought she was a jaguar one night so she's like walking around on all fours like growling and stuff then then you're there being like i will take care of you to yeah. your soul it's just <laughs> such a madhouse it is a madhouse and it's the most beautiful thing ever it's so yeah yeah Oh yeah. That reminded me of something else, but it's okay. Go on. So, yeah. So I just like, put my, reconnected my body with my soul, you know, which had been a little bit disconnected throughout this whole experience. And I, I, I still felt very connected to the energy of the universe. And I knew that I could just ask anything. And I decided to ask, what should I do next? Meaning in, in our life, we're approaching this like moment of transition. And very clearly I just received no attachment. And it wasn't necessarily the answer that I was hoping for. I was hoping for more clarity and more like, yeah. concise direction. So here's what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go this place, take start this, this class, project and by step. Here. Yeah. But instead it was no attachment and you know, higher self can be so unhelpful sometimes. Yeah. But like a year and a half later now, I feel like I have, I've explored that answer quite a bit first by Stepping down as CEO from Image Salon, that's, that was like a big attachment. Buying our house, next attachment, our life in Canada, mm-hmm. big attachment. And even here, as we try to attach ourselves to different projects, like they're not attaching. No, we don't uh, even have a house. No. And I guess I'm still integrating that, uh, mm-hmm. that lesson, but it's definitely shown up in my life quite a bit since. That was my night too. Yeah, this, as you were speaking, it reminded me of one thing at the, how I finished my night one, which was just feeling the energy in the room and being so proud of everybody for how hard they were working and also having moments of laughing because I was just like, oh my God, we've all forgotten who we are. Humans are so silly. Look at all the suffering we put ourselves through. And I just thought it was so funny and it's not, it's actually, I think really sad, but I'll, in the moment I was just like, and laughing can also be a purge, but I would laugh. And then I got caught in this kind of weird cycle, which can happen as well 
of being like, huh? oh my God, everything's awful. What the fuck? Oh no, I've thought of this before. Am I stuck in a cycle? Everything's fine. Everything's great. Everything's amazing. Oh no, everything sucks. Oh mm-hmm. no, I'm having the loop. I was stuck in it for a while and it really messed with me. But that being said, I really, I loved the moments on all four nights when I was able to connect to the energy in the room, like the Maloka space, like I've never experienced a space like that. It was so beautiful and so loving. And like, you're so well cared for all the helpers who are there. I haven't talked about them, but like when I was sobbing, someone came up to me and just put her hands on me and it was like, it soothed me so much. And the people who are throwing up get so much assistance. They have they get people who are fanning them and saging them. And it's just a beautiful space. I just feel such a sense of connection to all the other people who are doing this work. And on night one, I really had this moment of being like so proud of everybody yeah. and so grateful to be part of it. And just being like, we are all having a really hard time or a lot of us are having a hard time, but like we are doing good work. And I take that with me now in like the, the work that I'm stepping into, even with the journaling group, you know, I, I see A lot of people have experienced profound trauma, but they're showing up and they're sharing and they're working on their healing. And I, that same feeling is ignited in me where I'm just like, I'm so proud of us for doing this work because healing is for me, it's my life's work and helping others to do, to find it in themselves, to be able to heal themselves as well. And when we heal ourselves, like we're healing past generations and we're healing future generations and, you know, we're we're doing really important work. Anyway, that just yeah. reminded me of that. Yeah, that connection to other people in the room was something I wasn't necessarily expecting as we went into it. And we had our experiences, but seeing it happen for the other 50, 60 people who were there. Yeah, you literally get a front row seat oof. to watch people transform. There are people who from day one to day six, you couldn't even recognize them. Like they carried themselves completely different. There's just so much releasing that's happening. It's mm-hmm. just yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. All right. So that was your night two. Okay. Yeah. My night two. Oh God. Night two. So I came into night two with a ton of fear again, by the way, like ayahuasca did not release me of fear completely. Like I'm still navigating my relationship with fear big time, (laughs) but night two, I was like, okay, I went in with a plan, which is hilarious because you don't do that with ayahuasca. She's a grandmother. She knows better. Um, And I was like, okay, I'm not going to drink too much. I'm not going to have a second cup. Like I'm going to lay low and just kind of like, you know, I was scared. So I went in, I asked for not a full cup for a smaller cup, which I don't know. It wasn't even, it was probably more than half still. And then I go back to my mat or to my mattress and I started the first few things I'm having trouble remembering the first few things that happened were I also had um, some little ant energies. It felt like little ants, like little worker ants or something coming over me. And I was really asking that day, help me. um, Like, why do I need to be so comfortable? Why am I so afraid of discomfort? That was the intention, the question that I had. And then these little ants came and they helped me relax my body. Like they were like in my neck. And then I was like, ah, okay, relax my neck. And the vision that I had was of myself, like in a bed of like flowers, like a fairy princess of some kind with all of these little like ants who are there to just make sure that I'm comfortable. And I just kept thanking them like, oh, thank you so much for making me comfortable. I'm so scared, but like, you're helping me so much. And I was just so grateful for them for helping me be comfortable. And I just really felt like I was in my bed of flowers, just like resting and just felt wonderful. And that's honestly about all that I remember from that first part. I know that I heard the call for the second cup and I don't know if I physically did this, but it certainly feels like I put the blanket over my head and pretended that I didn't exist as if anyone's going to come up to you and be like, Hey, did you hear the call? You don't know what you're going through. But I, that's the memory I have basically. And I was like, nope, not doing it. Even though I fully, like I had barely scratched any surface of anything with that. It was just like a bunch of minions came and helped me feel comfortable. Oh, wait, no, that's not true. I had some visions. I'm sorry. I did have some visuals in the first part of that night. So before the call for the first cup, I, after that, I asked, why is it so hard for me? Why do I need to be so comfortable or something to that effect about comfort? And then I was shown, I was brought back to a bunch of different uh, memories of my childhood, times where I felt abandoned, alone, overlooked, unworthy, just a lot of these situations. I felt 
the distance between my dad and I, because he spent a lot of time, he would go to, to our, our family cottage, like after work. And when I was a teenager and I'd be home alone with my sister and I often wouldn't see him after school and I'd have to put myself to bed. And I don't know, as a teenager, I still felt like I felt a big divide between us. And I literally saw myself like in these visuals as being like in my house and then him being at the cottage. And I saw almost as if like a separation, like a void between us. I saw, I'm hesitant to share this, to be honest. Um, I saw it myself as a kid, as like a four-year-old, I was four years old in like the apartment of the woman that my dad had left my mom for. He left her for, I don't know how long, but briefly around the time my sister was born, or I think my mom was still pregnant with my sister. And he brought me to this apartment. This is true. It's a memory. It's an actual memory. I've revisited this memory in psychoanalysis as well. And yeah, I was shown that again, but I saw myself as a child and I felt her feelings. Like I felt her thinking, oh, he left us for this family because this woman has two boys and I'm about to have a baby sister or I just had a baby sister. So I guess it's because like, we're not good enough and he needed to replace us with boys. And as a four-year-old, that's what I believed. And I was shown that. And then I was shown myself being sexually abused on the couch in my grandfather's apartment. I saw you know what? I'm saying this now and I have a feeling that was on night three and not night two. But anyway, I'm going to keep going with that. It's so it's such a blur, honestly. I saw it happening and instead of feeling sad for my little girl self, I looked at her and I was like, you're going to be okay. Like we're okay. But I saw him and felt bad for him and I had mm-hmm. compassion for him. And that really showed me how far I've come in my healing journey and how much I've done to heal and to like, it's, it continues to be a journey. I've always been very public about it. I've, you know, shared about it online and stuff, but that was yet another layer to that healing. And that also gave me a lot of validation for the work that I've done. I was in psychoanalysis for a while. I did this project, taking those self-portraits in the house. I've spoken openly about what happened to me. I've even had a chance to forgive him face to face before he passed away, which was one of the bravest things I've ever done in my life. And I saw how all of these things that I've done have been like these beautiful acts of self-love to myself to release the pain of the trauma of what happened to me. And that out of that, I got the ability to be able to watch this happen in front of me and to actually feel compassion for the person who hurt me the most. That was really powerful. And it's something that I knew could happen because I've heard a lot of experiences of people with trauma going, sitting with ayahuasca and being shown their trauma, reliving their trauma. So I knew it could happen, but I had this idea that it was going to be this really scary, horrible thing, like reliving a trauma, that it was going to be a trauma in and of itself. But of course it's medicine. Like ayahuasca is not going to show you something that's not going to help you and help you heal ultimately. So that's really what um, that experience was for me. It was really actually quite beautiful. Again, questioning whether that was night two or night three, but the rest of night two, assuming this happened on night two was really hard because I bailed out on the drink, the second drink, even though I was fully, I felt like I was fully like back. I definitely could have gone back for another drink. I wasn't out of my mind in any way. And I didn't because I was scared. And then I had, it was like several hours, but honestly, it felt like weeks of just lying there feeling like a piece of shit for not drinking the second cup for feeling like I had failed ayahuasca, everybody around me. Like I would hear someone throw up and I'd be like, that person's doing it right. And I'm a failure. And just the self abuse. It was my, my self-talk just in all its terrible glory. (laughs) Does that work? Terrible glory, Mm -hmm. just nonstop beating myself up for everything. And it was like, it just kept going and going and going. And it was a ceremony in of itself because it showed me how I speak to myself. And I was like, I was so afraid of losing my mind that night that ayahuasca goes, sure you can keep your mind. Here it is. Mm. Now be with it and see how it really treats you. 
So it was an ass kicking of epic proportions. And I felt so awful, but it taught me a lot about how I treat myself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I do not speak to myself like that anymore. I can say that now and hopefully we'll never again, because that was awful. But what a lesson through the not drinking the second cup. I probably was probably what I needed to do in order to be with my mind and to see what I was doing to myself. Yeah. Once you give something like that, your attention, that's when it is able to transmute and turn into something else. Yeah. There's no way to, to change something if you're not bringing your awareness to it. No, so, awareness yeah. is it's key. And yeah, that's exactly what that was. It was like, I had nothing else to do. I wanted to leave so mm. bad. I wanted to know what time it was. I was like, how long do I have to sit in this prison of my own mm. mind? It's really what it was. And my head was hurting. And I remember I was trying to sleep. I was like, maybe if I sleep, but of course there's no way yeah. this is your lesson. You're here. You got to be here for it. Yeah. But it did set me up for night three. Mm -hmm. Cause on night three, I was like, fuck that. I'm not doing that again. I am all in. I trust you. I will show up and I will do what I need to do. So that was helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Do I carry on since you're sure. into night three? Okay. Night three. The reason why it's mixed up in my mind is because I took the same spot for night two and night three. Mm. So I mix the two nights. I don't remember what's night two and what night, what's night three as a result. Okay. <laughs> night three, I will try to make sense of all of this. I was with Mama Ayahuasca or a guide or some kind of like feminine energy that was guiding me. So that was women's night too, right? Yes, it was women's night. They have the divine feminine night. So <clears throat> I'm with Mama Ayahuasca, is what it feels like, or some kind of motherly energy. And I'm in my high school home ec class is what it feels like. And she's, her energy is above me. I'm in this space and I am telling her she's trying to teach me. So at the same time, this is so hard to explain, but at the same time as this scene is going on, this is happening. I'm also in other places at the same time. And I can move from one to another, almost, I don't know how to describe it. Some like veil, like I'm able to move from one layer to another. And in one of these layers of my awareness or my consciousness was seeing the fractals and the visuals that the medicine was bringing on. So I'm in the space of seeing like this pyramid and I'm wondering like, what's on the other side, what's inside this. And I'm asking questions. And then I'm back in the home at class with mama ayahuasca and she's not yet focus, breathe, be here, be present. And my mind kept like wandering. I kept being like, what about this? And I was like a, a little kid that was like a bit rebellious or a bit rambunctious. And she kept being like, sweetie, not now let's focus on what we're doing. And I'd be like, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know I'm supposed to listen. Okay. Do you still love me? And she'd be like, of course, I still love you. Now, please focus. And I'd be like, okay, okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like I was, that was my energy. Like I was so silly and my little kid and I just wanted her to love me. And even though I was like being mischievous a little bit and asking the questions when I wasn't, it wasn't time and I was being very distracted, she still would show me this unconditional love. But it was very much that of a mother and a child. And I needed to kind of like, I just felt that kind of energy between us. To be honest, I don't remember much of what else went on and it's hard to explain. It was very like more of feeling like I'd feel fear and then she would show me how to breathe through fear. And then I would, yeah, be scared about the future of something. And then she would remind me that we only have here and now and come back to the present. So basically I feel like she was showing me how to meditate, how to be present. It was like a class in my home at class mm -hmm. of how to do that. And then the call came for the second cup. And as you remember from my previous night, that was my, my undoing, demise. my demise. <laughs> so the call went and I just heard, you have to be brave now. So I was like, okay. So I like picked myself off my mattress and brought my bucket. Cause I felt so queasy and I was, I could barely move. Honestly, I was so like, Ooh, I was scared again. So I go up and Sarah, I go to Sarah again and she's like, how are you feeling sister? And I'm like, I think I need to be brave right now. Like, I swear that's how it came out. I felt like my mouth couldn't even say the words. I just, yeah, I just shared with her. I need to be brave. And she said, okay, pours me my cup. And she says, I think I, I took the drink and she says, go back to your mattress and 
sit up straight, keep your spine straight and keep your head up and remember who you are. Something like that. I love how they really know what to say. They just know. Every single one. It doesn't matter what you tell them, what you, they see, what you throw at them. They just like always have the perfect one line to like yeah, make totally. everything right. And that's when I actually remember there was a lot that I don't, you know. So I go back and I just want to lie down in fetal position. I'm feeling like, oh, I'm scared, like a scared little kid. I'm like, mommy, I'm scared. And I just wanted to be held. But she had told me to be brave. So I was like, I, I had told her I needed to be brave. So she gave me a tool for how to do that. So I did. I sat, went back to my mattress. I sat up straight, even though I felt like I wanted to lie down. And I just felt strong. It was like I got my power back. And then eventually when I laid down again, I was back with Mama Ayahuasca or this feminine energy teacher, motherly energy. And she was so proud of me. And she was just like, she was no longer up above me. She was now in front of me. Again, no physical form, just energy. And we were woman to woman. She was like, you did it, sister. Like it was, I wasn't a little kid anymore who was being rambunctious. I was now like a woman and I was, she was like seeing me as a woman and she had taught me whatever she needed to teach me that night. And it was awesome. It felt so good. And there was a lot that went on that night. Honestly, I had a lot of different things that I navigated. It's this like dance and there's music. It was live music that night, which was unbelievable. Yeah. The When music can have like taste music, it has <laughs> color. It's, it was like a physical entity in the room is yeah. what the music felt like that night. And I was bliss. I just laid there for probably hours in the most comfortable, blissful state I've ever been in. I felt so light. I felt like no pain. And I have so much pain in my body. You know, I have spina bifida. I have like a bump in my lower back that makes it really hard for me to lay on my back. But I was on my back, like in a way that I normally could never, a position I could never be in, feeling zero pain in my shoulder. That's caused me pain for years and continues to, to this day felt amazing. And it was just, yeah, bliss. Like it felt so good. The music was amazing. And I was just like fully present in that blissful moment. Like I was just, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like I couldn't stop giving gratitude for everything and for this moment, for this feeling Gosh, I could keep talking about it, not because it's probably interesting to hear about, but because I remember by talking about it, what it feels like to be in that moment. And it was amazing. It was very hard for me to come out that night, though. I remember you came, everybody yeah. left, and I was still like, oh, I didn't want to come back into my body. I didn't feel like I was out of my body. That's the thing. I needed to pee. I would get up and I would go pee. And then I would laugh about how I hadn't gone to pee yet. And oh, I should just do that. That was literally a thing that happened that night. That was when I heard, listen to your body. If you need to pee, go up and pee. And I was like, oh, okay. Ha, 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 ha. You know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was still in my body during the experience. I didn't leave the way that you did yet coming down from that high of a vibration enough for me to get up and walk back to our room felt like an impossible task. And I was so queasy, so queasy. I remember you like held me as I walked and every few steps, I was like, I'm going to throw up. At the up. same time though, you have the biggest grin on oh, your yeah. face and you just, I remember looking at you were like, I feel so good. I felt so good. <laughs> you were like good. this like happy drunk baby. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. I was a happy drunk yeah. baby. Okay, wait, I remembered something though that belongs in night two about the little aliens, the little ants. I I remembered it because of my shoulder. I also went into ayahuasca hoping for a cosmic surgery for my shoulder that's, you know, been giving me such trouble for so long. And I did have the experience of feeling the presence of beings around my bed. I had a light above me, like an, on an operating table or like a dentist light that was so strong that I even, I remember opening my physical eyes to be like, did someone turn on a light in here? Because it was so bright. And then closing my eyes and being like, oh no. Okay. And then I felt the presence of these beings around me. And I too was very surrendered because I wanted this. So I was like, yay, you're here. You're going to perform my surgery on my arm. I'm so glad you're here. And so I was listening very well as being very still. And then I felt like a scanner, like going 
from head to toe. And I felt like they were scanning my body. And I was like, cool, I'm getting an exam of some kind. I even felt them. This sounds messed up, but I felt them call in like a special. I don't know how to describe that, but that's just the sense I got. I felt a door opening, someone walking in who had like more authority than the others. And I felt that being inspecting me. I felt them chattering about me and then they left. And I was like, wait, no, you didn't help me. And I took it at the time as being like, they couldn't heal me because of a reason. (laughs) I don't know why, because it's, I need to heal myself maybe from this or because it still has lessons to teach me. And sure enough, my shoulder has taught me a ton of lessons, which I could get into, but I really do feel looking back now, almost a year and a half later that they did not heal me because I needed to still learn lessons from it. Mm -hmm. But I'm very jealous that you got healed. It's not fair. I didn't want to cut you off before, but when you were, when ayahuasca came down to your level and said you did it, like almost like congratulated you for taking that second cup. Yeah. It wasn't about the act of the second cup. It was just like you doing something that was scary to you and being brave about it. Totally. Yeah. It was about facing the fear, which I've since in my life had opportunities to feel that too, that feeling of pure joy that comes from facing fear and coming out on the other side. You know, just on Monday, I have been feeling a lot of fear in the last couple of weeks. And I went, we went to an ice bath and I knew I needed to do this. And every part of my body was resisting it. I did not want to get into that freezer of ice water, but I knew I needed to do it. And I could feel it in my body, what the fear felt like. And that's another thing that honestly, I feel like I was taught is what does it feel like in your body to be in fear? And what does it feel like to be in power? And a felt sense of that. And on Monday I went into the ice bath being like, fuck, I'm carrying so much fear. I know I need to release it. I know I need to step into this literally. And after I did, I mean, you were there, I had the biggest emotional release. I posted a photo on Instagram this week about it, but I just was sobbing and then felt amazing all week after I felt like so good. Like I just released something. And it's also the release is by facing it, doing the something that scares you can be so powerful. And in that case on night three, it was just drinking the second cup and knowing that I came here to do that. Like I knew I needed to do it. There was no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's a million other things that happened to me that night, but that's what I remember. I'm sure the important stuff came out. Yeah. Before going into night three for me, I remember kind of pondering my intention with all of it. I think there's three different types of people who come to sit with plant medicines. It's, you know, either to heal trauma, to cure from addiction or to, which is the same thing as healing trauma. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. There's a lot of connection and to connect on a deeper level with spirituality. And to a certain extent, I'm fortunate enough to, you know, not have had intense trauma in my life and not be battling any kind of addiction. And so I, I felt like a lot of comfort in the whole hyperspace whenever I would, I was drinking the first two nights. And I remember just almost like feeling confused as to why I was there and what I wanted to get out of the experience. And I remember going to Paola, who was one of the teachers there. And I forget exactly word for word what she said, but she really invited me to go out and explore, you know, this, this whole universe that we get projected into when we drink. I don't have the exact intention in front of me, but it was somewhere, you know, along those lines, wanting to just go out and explore a little bit more. When I went back to my mat after drinking, I remember very quickly, like within a few minutes, just feeling this intense pressure on my forehead, like someone, like a giant person had all of their weight in their foot, stepping on my forehead. And there was like no getting rid of it. It was just like, it it got to the point where it was like really excruciating. And then out of nowhere, this light appeared in my third eye and the silhouette of a praying mantis appeared. And all she did, and I say she, because for me, it was feminine. All she did was just tap her pincers, pincers. What's the word? 
I don't know. Their little claw thingies. Her little claw thingies. <laughs> her hands. At my third eye to relieve me of that immense pressure. It, it was like a split second. The moment she did that, poof, just everything just opened up and I found myself floating in this black void again. And the pressure was completely gone. Uh, from, so cool. From my head. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, there's like this transition, I think, when you take the plants. Yeah. When you, you, I've experienced this with mushrooms as well. Is you it kind of like, you have to go like to the other side. And mm. I think there are different things you can do to ease that transition. Breath work being one of them. Reciting mantras I've heard can also be really helpful. So I'll be playing around with those in the. Yeah. Let us know how it turns yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> in the next one. Um, once I found myself in this like infinite void, I just saw everyone in the room as like their own speck of light, myself included. I couldn't really see any of the humans. It was just lights everywhere. Some were dimming more brightly. Some were a lot more faded, Shining more sorry, shining more brightly. Some were a lot more dim. And I intuitively knew to use my hands to send love to the ones who were a little bit more dim because they needed the love and the support to get through whatever they were going through. And so I started channeling the energy of love in my hands and making little balls of it or lightning bolts and just sending them to all of the people that needed it. I would, um, it felt almost like I had water in the form of love on my hands. So I would just flick my hands and shoot it out that flick way. Flick your love water all over. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um, I would make balls and I would shoot basketball hoops to like the other side of the room. I really almost started having fun with it. It was, I felt like I was, I had a lot of love to give like really in this beautiful arena and I knew what to do in it. And then after giving out all of this love, I would feel depleted. And I felt that I myself needed the love. So I would bring the hands back to myself. I would put a hand on my chest, a hand on my belly, and just breathe in and replenish myself through my hands. And then I would feel a lot of energy that needed to move through me. So I would just do these like jazz fingers, like snap my fingers, and I would shake like a lizard and make like a sound. I just like all kinds of like weird shit was happening. And What's then fun I, is you get to talk to your neighbor the next day at breakfast and yeah. be like, those were some cool sounds you were making yeah. last night. <laughs> and then I would feel better and I was ready to go again and like send love again to everybody in the room. So it was like this like beautiful dance between like giving love to others, taking care of myself, giving love to others, taking care of myself. And I'm sure there's a hidden meaning in there somewhere. I'm some sure. kind of lesson. I don't know. <laughs> It's a, it's a little mysterious. <laughs> yeah. Can't figure it out. Very cryptic. <laughs> and the the guy next to me was having a really hard time that evening. He was just like purging so much. And it wasn't like the act of vomiting. It was just like feeling like how much pain he was like releasing. I remember just like feeling for him. And at some point I lay down on my side. I just put my hand out and I intuitively sent him the message. I was like, if you need my support, if you need my hand, it's here for you. And I didn't know in the moment if he got it or not. He didn't grab my hand, but we did have a chance to talk about it later in the week. And he did see and feel my presence at my hand. And he he did understand that I was reaching out for him but he had a bit of a hes hesitation. He wasn't, he, I remember him being like, I wasn't quite sure. I didn't want to like take your hand and be weird. Yeah. Yeah. But so there was like this like intuitive understanding that we were there for like each other. Died of adorableness. If you guys were holding hands. Yeah. <laughs> and then I remember Sarah, the shaman coming to see him and like really helping him get through it, telling him to release it. And soon it'll be over. And I remember Wait. what's coming is going. I remember just like holding my hands up like towards her as well, just like giving her the energy and the love because she's helping so many people. So she must be feeling depleted as well. I just felt so connected on an energetic level to like everyone in the room. And it was just such a powerful experience. So you broke the rules of like mind your own the business. Rules is one mind your own business. Yeah. <laughs> don't get involved in what other people are going through and just have like, your own experience. I didn't get up and do anything, but 
just used my hands. Do you feel, side note, that mm. this kind of experience has inspired you because you just completed your Reiki one training mm. and you want to continue on to the other levels? Yeah. Do you feel like this kind of experience has inspired you, made you feel like you want to work with your hands, N moving energy? Yeah, not analytically in that moment. I wasn't like, I, I will now do right. Reiki, but shit, I just connected something else, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. That's Ooh, pretty cool. Keep me waiting. Yeah. But yes, I definitely felt like the power, like the energy, the life force, like moving through my hands. And I believed that it was like a real thing. And so when the idea of training in Reiki came up, came about, it was definitely a lot more. Do you think that you wouldn't have believed that before? Yeah. You were I mean, skeptical about oh, everything. Sure. You're from a very skeptical family through yeah. also not your mom, but your siblings and yeah. Yeah. like very skeptical they need like evidence and stuff <laughs> for sure and i was like that too but i understand i mean you you want like you want to feel it for yourself before you fully believe it i'm yeah. still like that with a lot of things um yeah and then i remember sarah being back at her on her spot at the front of the room and i remember her light dimming and i remember hearing her purging and moving like all of this like energy that she's channeling and moving for other people it was heavy too like it was a heavy week because we were the yeah. first group after the pandemic when yeah. they reopened after being closed for like seven months or something so yeah. we brought with us a lot of absolutely. energy from the collective absolutely yeah yeah so i was sending her love and then i just remember things reversing and me starting to receive all of this like wisdom into my hands like all of the ways that I can show up better in the world, the way that we can raise our kids better. Mm, yeah. I remember having some of those visions as well. Yeah. It's like, I don't need to fix all of humanity. All I need to do is take care of the people who are closest to me, take care of my family and yourself, myself. And if everybody does this, then that's how we heal the world. And as I would receive this wisdom in my hands, I would place my hands on my head and just kind of like download all this information into my head so I could really hold on to it as one does, obviously. That was like a very like straightforward experience, but I was in it for a very long time. Uh, I, I also remember at times like just seeing how infinite this like fifth dimension is where like we're all just connected and we know everything and it's there's no body there's no time there's no nothing and it would scare me a little bit i was like oh, i don't want to be like stuck in this like infinity forever yeah the human mind cannot comprehend yeah. that yeah it was hard for me to understand it like as daniel at the same time yeah but through a lot of my research and work since like i understand that dimension exists and that's why the third dimension exists so we can come here and experience things and taste food and swim in the ocean, like have all of these experiences that are not possible in the fifth dimension. Mm -hmm. And grow and learn and love and all of that. Yeah. And finally, like the last thing before I really came back into my body, I got a vision of a bonsai oh, yeah. come to me. It was like vivid as this moment is right now. Like it just really came to me and for the longest time, I associated it to my dad because he had a love of bonsais. And as we got one last year at home and Are I- Are you sure it's dead now? Yeah, I failed to take better care of it, which is okay. But as we were talking about Reiki, Reiki originated in Japan. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it was a symbol sent to me- Perhaps. To connect with the energy of Reiki and maybe. the practice of Reiki. Or maybe it was my dad sending me that symbol- so that I it would lead your dad had bonsais yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. so that's the connection i made uh, yeah. a few moments ago also max and i believe that we had a past life together in japan mm, yeah. yeah side note <laughs> um and that's it and yeah then the live music took over and oh i'm so actually jealous that yeah. you had the opportunity to get up and go and sit and watch the musicians like watching them play must have been such an incredible experience yeah. while on the medicine yeah i was already like in the front of the room i always try to pick a spot that was like close to the shamans because i really enjoyed seeing them work and i was like something beautiful about it but then i went even closer to the musicians and there was like a small group of people and we we're all like cuddle puddle there <laughs> and 
asked this girl if I could just rest my head on her mattress. And she told me I have the energy of a calm cat who just wants to <laughs> cuddle with people. And I thought it was like the sweetest thing <laughs> anyone's ever told me. And yeah, it was just like this like beautiful and the whole night just mm -hmm. yeah, tasting and feeling and seeing the music like come alive. It was a moment I'll never forget. And I look forward to it again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Night four should be quick. It should be quick because we did not drink that night. And yeah, yeah what <laughs> happens? So on the fourth night at uh, Rhythmia, I don't know if they still do this, but when we were there, they serve Yahe, which is a slightly different brew of ayahuasca. And it is said to be more intense and really purge you of anything that needs to be purged. And a lot of people do at the same time run to the bathroom to puke and shit their pants at the same time at the same time and the only class we had that day was like on thursday was nearing the end of the week the only class we had that day was for 10 minutes yeah during just, we just want to give you a quick overview of what to expect tonight so yeah. you're probably going to shit your pants you're going to puke more than you've ever puked before it's going to be super intense any questions and we're like uh yeah did it, i sum that up well? perfectly on point mm -hmm. and it sent me and both of us i think into a bit of a tailspin about like oh my God, I don't want to do this. We've already done so much work. I'm so tired. I wish they hadn't said anything, to be honest. Absolutely. I really feel like they did not set me us too. up well for that yeah. at all. And the thing they also said that really scared me almost more than the medicine itself is like, the, instead of 30 minutes of silence, oh, yeah. like sitting in meditation, it was going to be two hours. Two hours. And it was going to be all night too, up until like um, sunrise. after sunrise and like to keep going back for more drinks and stuff. And I was like, oh, like I was more exhausted than I'd ever been in my life. Yeah. I had taken in more teachings than I ever thought were possible. Just had basically, I could not fathom the idea of doing another night, let alone the most intense night yet. And I wrestled with the decision for so long. I went back and forth. I talked with other people. Some people were like, you're here. Why would you not do it? And other people were like, listen to what you want. Like, it's whatever, you know? So I had no clue what to do. Um, I was really wrestling with it. And I could not figure out which part of me was resisting and which part of me was not. Mm -hmm. No, all parts of me were resisting. But it was one of those things. It's like, is this fear? Do I give in to fear if I don't drink? Or am I respecting the part of me that knows better and that knows that I've had enough for now and that I need to take a break. Like mm -hmm. I just had no clarity on it whatsoever. And it really messed with my mind to be totally. honest. Yeah. Me too. I, I, I didn't want to go to this ceremony at all. I just wanted to go to our room and go to sleep, go to sleep. But then for some reason, I was afraid that they were going to know I wasn't there and they were going to come knocking and be like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why are you not in ceremony? <laughs> I could have pretended to have my period because they, yeah. Hey, does not yeah. like apparently the energy of a menstruating woman is like really intense for the yahe space and so if you're menstruating you're supposed to not go to ceremony and i was like damn it why yeah. couldn't i have my period but then i remember speaking with someone and she said she had been to rhythmia before and she said you can come to ceremony and just not drink mm -hmm. and that gave me a lot of relief i was like oh that's an option okay i guess i'll do that yeah and she recommended that we speak with the shaman to just kind of get their insights, see if they have anything to say. Maybe it was going to be a problem for them to, if we were in the space without drinking. So when the everybody entered the Maloka, I did go to speak with Mitra Pelodi, who was the, the shaman. And there were evening. a lot of people who didn't drink that night. Yeah, A lot of us felt the same way, just drained and we're good for now. Thank yeah. you, but no thank you. And when I told him I was hesitant to drink, he, well, I wasn't hesitant for me. It was like a pretty hard no. <laughs> uh, he just was so gentle and loving and he was, that's totally fine. If ever you change your mind and you feel called to drink at any point during the night, just come and see me. Otherwise you're welcome in this space. You're welcome to take part in the healing circle he was doing later. And I was like, oh, this is so nice and gentle and not necessarily what I expected. And when I went back to my mat, the woman who was next to me, she was equally terrified as I was. I proceeded to tell her, you actually don't need to drink. I just want to speak with Mitra. And he said it was fine. And I gave her like such deep relief 
Like she, she went from like small and like fearful to like, oh my God, this, I can. Maybe you ruined it. Maybe she was meant to drink that night. Maybe. I guess that's why I kinda, That's maybe that's why I hesitated a little bit, but <gasps> no, I was able, I, like, I was glad I didn't like keep this like secret to yeah. myself. That's where, what felt wrong more than anything. Yeah. I know a lot of us didn't drink that night. The woman next to me also didn't drink that totally. night. And- like when I saw like the lineup for the drink, like I was like, oh, at least half the room right now is sitting down. Mm-hmm. Like, that yeah. kind of gave me comfort in a way. Yeah. I will say that I wrestled for months afterwards, even oh, yeah. it, I left the experience on a bit of a note of being like, did I do the right thing? Did I wuss out? Did everything I learn about fear and conquering fear, was that like a test and I failed? Like it messed with me a lot in the months afterwards. Yeah. And I know today that I would drink that cup Mm -hmm. because I would need to. Yeah. And maybe that's enough. Maybe that's. Yeah. But having said all that, I did still have a really powerful experience. And they say you used to have a lot of medicine coursing through your body. And that's evident in the days afterwards where our dreams are pretty crazy and we still have a lot of insights come to us. You're vibing very high. Yeah. And obviously you're in a ceremonial space. So that brings up a lot of things. So even without actually ingesting the medicine, I still had a very profound experience. Um, The first thing I did, you know, in the two hours of silence, I just try to meditate for as long as I could. I have no clue how long it, it was. But I remember just feeling like my head was going to detach from my body. It was like a very physical sensation. I've never experienced crown chakra, like opening from what I. Yeah. Yeah. And then nothing came from that. I just got really tired and I took a little nap. I must have (laughs) dozed off for, you know, a couple hours. And when I woke up, they were starting to gather people for the healing circle. So they would get uh, maybe 10, 12 people at a time. And the shamans went around and, you know, performed this really intimate ritual for each person. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. The experience itself was amazing. I didn't have much come to me in that moment. But when I went back to my bed, I received so many memories of my dad and I, again, from my childhood, which, you know, was really the reason why or not the reason, but it was really like the intention I had set for that whole week was to reconnect with my childhood. And it was all such beautiful memories of playing tennis with him, of him taking care of us, of being on trips together, of going to photography workshops. So yeah, it was such a gift, like to relive all of to that. relive all of that. I really felt like he was there with him. And it wasn't as intense or visual as nine, two or three were for me, but it was just so powerful. And I had so much gratitude for that whole experience and the whole week. I guess, yeah, it was beautiful. And then we found each other, I think outside and we watched the sunrise together Mm -hmm. and the parrots were flying about. And I feel like that's when the seed of Costa Rica was really planted Mm -hmm. in both of us. It was like... Like how beautiful like this place is. Yeah. I associate that moment really with like the tether. Yeah. It's, we get this, you know, people want to know why Costa Rica, we weren't looking to move somewhere. That was never an idea we had. It was that we felt like we needed to be back in Costa Rica. There was just such a strong call. And I say we, because it's each of us individually, you know, we both felt so strongly. I remember leaving on the plane and just looking out the window and being like, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. I just felt it. I was like, we have to go get our kids. We got to sort some things out, but we'll be back Mm -hmm. really soon. And we, for whatever reason needed to do that. And then sure enough that you're, you were talking earlier about no attachments and I, when we came back and we decided we're going to be going to Costa Rica for a couple months with the kids, took them out of school and everything. Um, we knew we needed to rent out our house in order to be able to, you know, afford to do this. We can just keep paying our mortgage and be on the road for so long. So we put our house on Airbnb and I would not have been able to do that before. I was very attached to that house and allowing strangers to come in and stay in our house and sleep in our bed. Like it I would not have been down for that before, but I was like, you know what? 
this is life is calling me right now to Costa Rica. And if it means that I need to rent out my house to make that happen, then that's a blessing. It's allowing me to do that. So I'm going to see it that way. And that step of being able to do that for a couple months, I think that led us to being able to completely detach from the house and actually sell it to be able to be here permanently. So it, it really is a byproduct of the experience of ayahuasca that we ended up here in Costa Rica. We would not be here if it wasn't for that. And not what I, I would also not have even, I think, allowed myself to follow through with that big of an idea. It's so much releasing happens through that experience. And then you get to see like, what does life have in store for me? And can I get curious about where I'm being guided to and what I'm being called to and fear? It's so much more exciting to live life from a place of curiosity versus fear. And like you fear is fear can be the same thing. Really? Mm. You're like, I'm scared of this, or I'm curious about this. So you can use them interchangeably. And I don't know. I think I got a lot of that courage from the ayahuasca experience. And though I still battle with fear a lot, I have a, I can have a very different relationship with it today. Thanks to everything that I experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to quickly talk about also about breath work Mm -hmm. the day after on the last day on the Friday, I had a, a very deep experience that kind of almost sealed the whole week for me. And it was led by a geo from elemental rhythm and it's ecstatic breath work. So do several rounds of like really intense breathing. And then you're guided through a meditation that reconnects you to your childhood. An inner child meditation. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And I just remember seeing myself. (laughs) Bless you. I'm so sorry. I tried to go as far from it. It's not good to hold in your sneezes, so I wouldn't do it. Um, I was like, I saw myself as a eight or nine year old standing in the stairs at the house that we grew up in, witnessing my parents fighting. And I was able to come to that eight year old version of myself and look at him in the eye and put my hand on his heart and really tell him everything is going to be okay. And the moment I did that, it was just like such a healing energy, you know, like that happens within you because that eight-year-old is still you. Yes. It's not, you're not talking to this other entity. It's still the same you, just time has gone by. I'm literally doing inner child in my, with my journaling group, the, the one in person I just introduced like inner child. And one of the things that I was telling the group is it's like a timeline jump. You get to time travel. Yeah. You go back in time and be with your inner child, with your childhood self and give them what they needed at the time. And it's never too late for that. You know, mm-hmm. like just because you didn't get it in the timeline that we're in now, you didn't get that at the time. There's no one who came up to you in that moment and gave you that love and that comfort but you're able to give that to yourself now. And like you're saying, it does still exist. The eight-year-old self is still in there. Mm-hmm. Giving them love today and giving them what they need today is just as valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Um, again, I sobbed uncontrollably. Like I thought I was going to need to be like carried out of that room at <laughs> the end. And it was just releasing this like energy of sadness that was stored deep within me. And it was such a beautiful release. And I felt so great afterwards. It was a very powerful experience. Yeah. Inner child work is awesome. Can I plug that? I have an inner child meditation on my website. (laughs) If anyone wants to do it, it's really, it's it's beautiful work. It is. Yeah. Um, afterwards we came back, we had to quarantine for two weeks. So we spent uh, some time at a cottage that we rented out in nature and integration is such a important part of the experience like you should definitely not go back to work like the next day you try to spend as much time on your own spend time meditating doing yoga still eating as healthy as you can Jour- not just going right back into your old habits yeah, basically journaling it's really an opportunity to yeah form new habits and to start creating a new life for yourself there's such a big reset that happens both 
or mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's a re- really an opportunity to build something from scratch again. I had a very hard time <clears throat> with my integration. Even when you're mentioning that house that we rented after, I just mm-hmm. remember coming back and being in that house and just feeling really bad. Honestly, mm-hmm. I think it's something maybe we don't hear people talking about a lot because you want to say ayahuasca was the best experience of my life. And I came back totally changed and everything. I lived happily ever, ever after. But to be honest, like some of the darkest moments of my life were in the months afterwards. It didn't help that it was like December and January of 2020 and 2021 in Canada where it's like cold and everyone's locked in and all of that doesn't help. But it was just, I think I expected a lot out of my post ayahuasca self and coming back and feeling so low and just yucky, I guess, for lack of a better word, it like, it's not what I expected. And it messed with me a little bit. I think a part of me was wanting to be, to feel better than I did. And I don't think I was being very honest with myself about the way I really felt. And I had some like really dark moments and then guilt about not feeling better because I had just had this experience and surely I should feel amazing now. And what's wrong with me that I don't. And so it was a bit of a a night to experience for a few months. It was hard. It was really hard. And also coming back to the life there was hard too. Like we had to make some really big decisions for our business. It was a really uncertain time. It was really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It led us to wanting to be in Costa Rica and I could, I could not handle being there. I remember being in our house and just being like, I can't be here. I can't be here. I can't be here. I felt claustrophobic and I, it's not where I needed to be, you know? And then we came here and I still processed, I still continued to integrate a lot, but it was in an environment that was way more conducive for me to Mm -hmm. that healing that needed to be done. And yeah. Yeah. And we set ourselves up during that time for the life that we're living now here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a kind of the opposite. Yeah, which you I think- were infuriating. <laughs> it was like Saint Daniel has arrived. And yeah. I resented you so much yeah. for how fucking perfect you your life seemed and you seemed. And you know, I mentioned about how like you were during our week at Rhythmia and how like I saw a different side of you with mm-hmm. regards to your interactions with people and how drawn people were to you. But you just came back like just like a fucking Zen monk or something. Yeah. And it was infuriating. Yeah. I just was it's like, I had so much love for life. And I remember I was so happy in that little cottage. Like it's just, it's, it's interesting, like how we had such different experiences and there's no right or wrong here. It's not like I won, you failed. It's, it's nothing like that. It's just interesting to, to know that people can have very different experiences afterwards. But yeah. I felt so great. And I loved reading and I had so many ideas for different projects and things I wanted to do. And it was in a way it was a little bit hard to sit still because I had all this like creativity like flowing through me and I wanted to be productive in a way with all of it. I wanted to seize that opportunity of okay, but isn't that interesting? It is. Yeah. Because what you're saying now is like not Zen monk like in that you're like, I have ideas. Let me be productive with them and yeah. do something about them. Yeah. It is falling into old habits. It is for sure in a way. Just calling you out a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I saw myself needing, wanting distractions. Like Mm -hmm. we came back and suddenly we could eat a little bit more. And, you know, I remember like being like, I can't wait to smoke weed again. And like we watched Avatar and I was so happy to be watching a movie again. Like I just, I was really happy to be able to fall back into things that like distraction. Like we watched The Bachelor, remember? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's healthy and recommended. There's another podcast oh episode where we mentioned seriously it should become like a drinking game how many times how many yeah. i don't think we can get through an episode without mentioning yeah. it it's come up on other ones too now. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah the, the i i was on a high for quite a few months afterwards and eventually that kind of wore off but yeah what can you speak on that what is it like if it for it to you said wear off yeah. what does that even mean I would just wake up with this incredible energy every single day. And I was excited about everything and everything was, I felt very connected and patient. And I just felt a lot of joy. And eventually like all of the layers and yuckiness of life started kind of piling back on. And 
it's when you start forgetting again and there's ways to tap back into it, which I've done through breath work and other modalities, but nothing stuck for an extended period of time like ayahuasca did. And I'm not going back because I want to get that feeling again. I, I was realize. about to ask you. No, I, I realize I can have a very different experience this time. And So why are you going back? <laughs> Everyone wants to know. <laughs> um, I feel like the last year and a half has been such a transformative time in my life and for sure our lives together. Yeah, that's an understatement. Yeah. And I don't know. I feel like I'm on the other side of the dark night of the soul where, you know, everything breaks down and makes space for new things to be birthed. And this feels like an opportunity to kind of bookend that that growth that I've gone through the last year and a half and see what happens. I do also feel, I was talking to our friend this morning about this, that I really feel like we're on the cusp of the new and next step of our lives, you know, and I've been waiting for this for a while and training for it in a way and doing a lot of work leading up to it. And the reason I mentioned that is because she said, she's like, I feel like you guys are like starting something new right now. And mm. she attended your breathwork ceremony this week and her mind was totally blown by the experience. She had a super profound experience. And then she attended my journaling uh, group this morning. And she says, you guys are really like, she just sees it for us, which is amazing to have someone able to witness us in that new role and like giving a lot, a lot of validation. But I told her, I'm like, I really do feel like we're on the cusp of this new, the reason we came here, the yeah. new thing we're meant to step into. And I, from ayahuasca and from Rhythmia, I was able to experience sacred ceremony in a way that like probably would have really intimidated me in the past. I remember even at the beginning, it's there's like songs and there's like rituals and it's like something that can intimidate a lot of people, mm -hmm. especially people who don't have a spiritual practice themselves or who haven't been exposed to this. It can seem like a little weird and all of this, but I got to really feel the magic of all of that through the experience of ayahuasca. And that's like, I want to create that for others, not in ayahuasca ceremonies, but ceremony period, you mm -hmm. know? a safe space where you can really allow yourself to go deep mm. and with music and with smells as tools to take you there and to bring you that safe sense of safety. And yeah. I don't know, I'm excited for that. And um, I really think that I was, I got to really see the power of that mm. and to experience it. Yeah. I think the exact physical form of all of that isn't a hundred percent clear for either one of us or both of us together, but I think we can both sense that it's coming. And my, I got no attachment as one of the answers. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this time I'm going to get something with a little bit more <laughs> clarity mm -hmm. and more direction. At least I'm definitely calling it in this time. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've been on the podcast before, but do you want to reshare how people can connect with you? Sure. So I'm at Davina Kudish. K-U-D-I-S-H, like Daniel, on Instagram. And my website is divinapalik.com. I am planning on changing my Instagram handle. I have no, not talked no. to you about Are it. We but no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's time, I think, for there to be a bit more consistency between my I online identities. So yeah, divinapalik.com is my website. And I've been posting some um, meditations on there and probably will be posting breath work and practices on there eventually as well. I also have my, my journaling prompts on there. I have a basically like a program called, uh, healing with words. And that's what I've been hosting with um, my online group and my in-person group here in Costa Rica, but the materials are also available for download. If you like want to follow along on your own and the purpose is really just to peel back some layers of healing around various events in our lives and bringing us back to a place of wholeness through the, through journaling, through expressing with words. And it's been a really powerful tool for me on my own journey. So that's what I created to be able to share that with the world. And I will probably be doing more groups, honestly, because I'm really loving it. The online group yeah. has been just amazing and I'm excited to be able to hold space for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for doing this. Thank you. It was a little impromptu. Two hour long. Two hours. Yeah. I love you. Love you.